All right, how is it going, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Forward Thinking Founders, where we're talking to founders about their companies, their visions for the future, and how the two collide. Today, I am so excited to be talking to Spencer Burley, who is a co-founder of Rent the Backyard. Spencer, welcome to the show. How's it going? Doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. You know, as I was telling you before we were recording, when I first heard about this company, I, I knew immediately that this is going to be something really big and I had to, you know, kind of dig in myself and learn more about what you're working on. Um, but to start, before we get into Rent the Backyard, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background, what got you here, and then, um, then you can dive into Rent the Backyard. For sure. Yeah, so I've always been uh, really interested in the housing space and in sort of uh, like different like in like economic programs and incentives. So uh, when I, I moved out to the Bay Area, I was thinking a lot about the, the housing crisis we have here. Uh, and along with my co-founder, we were really interested in approaching the, the solution, not just from like the, the renter perspective of uh, building new housing, but also seeing how we could incorporate uh, homeowners in and uh, to align the incentives between homeowner, homeowners and renters uh, such that things could actually kind of get done in this really gridlocked political space. So uh, we came across these things that the state calls accessory dwelling units uh, that we call backyard apartments. And we got really excited uh, because California has a, uh, released a whole lot of laws recently that uh, enable these units to be built much more easily. And um, people are really starting to take advantage and to build uh, these smaller units in their backyards. But uh, at the same time, they're really, really expensive to do uh, themselves. So what we came up with was a way where we uh, we we pay for and we build and then we manage a unit in people's backyard at no no cost to them at all, uh, and they get half the rent each month. All right. So let's walk through this. Let's say I am a property owner or just like a, a homeowner in San Francisco, and I have a backyard, a big enough backyard, and uh, I come across this website, you know, rentthebackyard.com, and, and, and it says, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll build a backyard in, in, well, sorry, we'll build a home in your backyard. Um, can you walk through the steps on me as a homeowner? What, what, what benefit, like, why would I want to do that? There's obviously several benefits, but I'm curious, what are the biggest ones for you? And if you can walk through how you actually do it, like, how to, like from idea to I have a home in my backyard that's making me money, how does that work? For sure. So to the first part, a lot of homeowners are, are coming to us because they have um, a, a large home that they purchased a long time ago. So think uh, back in the, the 80s or the 90s when home prices were a lot lower and um, they have a big backyard. But at this point, they're they're sort of getting towards the end of their working life or they're, they're looking at retirement or maybe they're just starting out and they want to be able to have a little bit of money, extra money to offset their mortgage but they have this, um, this big backyard, this space that's not really being used for anything. Uh, and they want to be able to kind of uh, use their property a little bit better. So what we do is we put that unit in and we, we manage it. So you can basically take this, this underutilized space you call your backyard and turn it into something that, that makes you money each month, uh, kind of in a similar vein to as if you had a, a spare room and you put it on Airbnb. Okay, so as I mentioned when we first started, I think this is genius. And I think it's genius because so many people in the Bay Area, well, actually, I'm not going to say, it. I don't, I'm not even fully educated on this. Can you explain what's going on in the Bay Area rent-wise and price-wise and, like, and, and just kind of dynamic-wise that makes something like Rent in the Backyard so, so much more crucial than potentially if it was around in like Arizona where maybe things aren't that expensive and they're more sprawled out? Sure, I'm, I'm not a macroeconomist, but um, in general, the situation here in, in the Bay Area has been one where, uh, where a, a lot more people have moved into the area than have moved out, and at the same time, uh, housing hasn't really been built. So over time, that's led to an expansion in, in just the price in general uh, of everything here in the Bay Area. The cost of living has gone way up, and uh, you really see a rise of people that are called super commuters here who... Um, commute more than 90 minutes each way to work every single day because it's too expensive to live uh, in, in a place like Mountain View or even San Francisco. Uh, so they're coming from places like Fremont and, and uh, other places far, far east uh, on the other side of the bay. And of course, that's a 
really difficult from a like a living perspective and having a family if you're spending three hours every single day commuting to and from your job. But it's also um, pretty terrible for the environment, right? Because a lot of these people are uh, are in their cars by themselves, um, sort of just stuck in traffic a whole lot of the way. So what we're trying to do is like make uh, make these places a little bit denser and uh, help uh, with the amount of housing in the region, both to be able to enable people to live a little bit closer to their work and uh, be a little bit more environmentally friendly and, and have a higher quality of life. And at the same time to, um, to hopefully help make the Bay Area a little bit more affordable place to live. Yeah, I love that. Uh, it, it's very smart. I, I'm curious, from the, the perspective of someone who would live in one of these homes in, in the backyard, what is your, like, what, what, what's your pitch to them? Or do you just list on Airbnb and for them, it's like, it's just like any other property. Like how, how what's the perception from people that are, that are checking out the one, the homes in the backyard? Yeah. So we do exclusively long-term rentals. So the way that's manifesting right now is we do 12 month rentals like to start and then it's month to month after that. So these are people that are, are definitely looking for a, a place where they're actually going to call like their primary residence. And I think the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive uh, because for a lot of people, we're enabling them to live, like as, like I said before, much, much closer to their work, um, to spend less time commuting. Uh, some of them might not even need a car because we're really close to different transit stations. Uh, so we're enabling people to go and um, uh, live, like just have that proximity to all the things that they're spending a lot of time in the car trying to get to each day. And at the same time, uh, we're also kind of, uh, because the units we build are a little bit smaller, they're 15 feet by 20 feet, so 300 square feet total. Um, we're kind of part of this uh, trend of tiny living as well, which uh, a lot of people are really excited about uh, for not only the um, sort of efficiency of being able to keep that space really tidy, but also from the perspective of having a, a lower environmental impact and, and sort of being able to live a, a little bit simpler, refined life. Absolutely. Something that, that kind of just popped up in my head is that if I, let's say I, I got a very big backyard and I, and I got it, you know, in the eighties or something, you know, where, where it's big, it wasn't expensive, but now it's kind of, now it's kind of, uh, this is all the space that I want to utilize. Am I able to have more than one home in my backyard or do you keep it to one home per backyard for now? So the way the current regulations are is that you can usually only put one of these in your backyard. Uh, there are a couple of new laws that are coming onto the books in 2020 and a lot of other laws that are sort of being planned and being thought about where you can do more than one. But uh, right now it is just one. Uh, we're really excited to see the laws move in uh, a really great direction. There's a lot of um, a lot of cities and the state of California in general is really thinking about this and, and think these accessory dwelling units can be a big part of the the solution to the housing crisis here. So this might seem like an odd question, but you mentioned a couple of times that you you know that there are laws coming in and the regulations that are changing. Where do you get your where do where do you look to know when laws are changing? How do you stay so ahead of the curve so you can build to where these things are changing, or is it kind of insider knowledge from network? Uh, so funnily enough, I think a lot of the the things come through Twitter. <laughs> in the sense that uh, there's a lot of uh, great uh, like legislators that are, are communicating directly with their constituents through there. And then a lot of other um, great accounts and um, sort of activist groups that are on Twitter, like talking about different things. Of course, we go straight to the source when we, when we hear about things. So uh, places like uh, the California like government's website where they post um, different drafts of different bills. But um, we found Twitter to be remarkably great for for being able to figure out sort of what's the climate look like. And then once we identify like, oh, there's this bill and this bill and this bill, we can go and we can just read it on the, the government's website. I have to be honest with you. If Twitter didn't exist, I think I would have zero, zero chance of breaking into the SF tech world. Like Twitter is this like the coolest <laughs> platform where you can just get on and start engaging with whoever you want to engage with whether it's, it's, it's lawmakers or regulators or whether it's other founders or whatever, I am a huge fan of Twitter. This is totally, this is a super random question, but because you mentioned it, I, I want to bring it up. Uh, ha, have you used um, 
Twitter, like what other ways have you used Twitter to further uh, your your personal brand or your company's brand or to get your knowledge or do you use Twitter in any, any ways other than what you just mentioned as like a tool to further kind of what you're trying to do? Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been getting more into Twitter in, uh, in the last year or so. I've, I've had an account for a long time, but at first I didn't really find it that valuable. But as I've increasingly lived in the, the tech world, uh, being able to just sort of direct message someone, like a question about their tweet or something like that, and being able to forge all these really random connections has been, uh, has been super valuable and interesting. We've actually had a couple of investors come through Twitter as well, which is um, a, a pretty interesting angle. Uh, I think uh, there's a whole, it's interesting to see all the different worlds uh, that exist on Twitter and how you can kind of join all of them. So like there's VC Twitter and general tech Twitter, but then um, I have a lot of like different interest in, in geopolitical issues. So you can follow like Latin America Twitter, like, like Argentinian Twitter, uh, or um, like Lebanese Twitter or something like that. So there's, it, it's interesting to see all these different communities and how uh, you can sort of be welcome and uh, sort of understand a lot about the world just by uh, taking a peek into them. It's, I agree with that. And I think it's kind of interesting that whenever I tell my friends that I'm super active on Twitter, they're like, oh, isn't Twitter just like a place where just, just so many bad people talk about bad things and it's just like a bad environment. And I know that that exists. Like a lot, there's a lot of bad things happen on Twitter. But I think if you carve out your your hundred to thousand followers that or follow people that you follow that are like who you want to be like or who you want to learn from, then it can be a pretty fun place. And I've been the, the last year. I have probably gone been on Twitter too much. But what can you do? <laughs> yeah, there's always the mute button too, right? So. <laughs> yep, for sure. Well, cool. So so let's go. Let's kind of go back to to rent in the backyard. So. Is this is this in, in motion right now? Are there people renting out their backyards? And if so, um, like how is it going? And a secondary question is: Is there any social interaction between the person living in the backyard house and the person who has the house with the backyard? Is there any friendship there? Or are they pretty separate? Yeah, so we're we're going through our first batch of units right now. So uh, in the process of like putting together a, a good group of them. In terms of uh, social interaction, it really varies by um, by who the homeowner is and who the tenant is. So from that, uh, like there are some homeowners that are, are looking to do this much more of like a, in in the sense of like a, a modern Airbnb host, I guess would be the best comparison. So like very, very professional, um, like maybe there's even like a little bit of fence that defines like this is your part of the backyard, this is my part of the backyard, and there isn't much interaction. Uh, so some homeowners value their privacy and uh we're, we're fine with that. Uh, there are other homeowners that are uh, um, uh, looking definitely to have that more of a like friendship and community aspect. So we actually have, uh, for a lot of the, the units, people are looking to house people like their friends or their family members in these units. So we see a lot of uh, like multi-generational families get really excited about uh, what we're offering. So being able to um, say, if you're, you're an elderly couple, you could put one of these units in the backyard move into the unit and then have your have your kids and their sort of family move into the, the larger house on the lot. And, and what that would let you do is your, your kids could save a lot of money on rent. And then you could also go and um, be able to, uh, to share that space and be close to your relatives. Uh, we see this a little bit uh, to a lesser extent with friends, but there are definitely a lot of, uh, uh, of tenants that will will sort of become friends with the uh, with the homeowner because everyone is just kind of friendly and they are looking to to build a community. So it, it's really interesting to see all these interactions and how they go and really how versatile uh, these units are. Uh, we see the the multi generational family with like grandparents live out back and then the the, the parents and and children uh, of the current generation live in the house, but also things like uh, like teenagers coming back after college. Uh, living in a, a back unit is also a, a use case, and there are a lot of others, and people seem to take it in, in really surprising ways that always really excite us. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like a lot of good social interaction could come from it and kind of redefine the word neighbor, uh, you know, what, na- what neighbor <laughs> looks like in the future. I I think I read this on your website, but I don't, I don't fully remember how this works. So are you also kind of a construction company where you, you, you match them up and then you build these, these 
tiny homes or these smart homes, um, or how do you, like, how do you actually build them? And if you, if you do build them, like, how do you get the expertise to know how to build that stuff? Yeah. So to our customers, we're, we're really full stack. So we, we pay for the unit, we build the unit and we manage the unit. So the, um, to our customers, like they're not doing any of those things on our end though, we're a, we're a smaller startup. Um, and we're definitely looking to, and we do work with um, different third parties that are really experienced in this space. So right now for, um, for the building process, we work with a, a really experienced builder that's built over 180 of these units all around the Bay Area. So they're able to really support us in things like uh, drawing up permits for cities and actually like having a factory to, to produce these units, which lets us scale and really focus in on the customer experience and then also like the financing side of the business to like make sure everything happens. Got it. I, I just got a, another random question. I don't know where, where these random questions are coming from, but <laughs> they're just kind of like popping up and I want to ask, I know very little about this world of, uh, of I'm just going to say it like, have you ever considered in the future that it is possible where you could have a home that is kind of looks the same in different backyards that you could like almost 3d print it once the technology is caught up? Is that way ahead of its time or is that actually something that people do or could do in the next couple of years? So there are actually a couple of companies that do 3d print, uh, like homes and we're really excited about those. Uh, the technology is just uh, a little bit um, in, in, so it's sort of in the development stages still. And we're trying to sort of go and uh, have an experience that's as consistent and, and replicable for our customers right now. So they have a really, they, they know exactly what they're getting and they know the timeline they're going to get it on and everything like that. So in the future, we definitely are excited about things like that. But right now we're really focused on building uh, more traditionally built units, although they are built almost entirely off site and then uh, moved into the backyards uh, in just a couple of days. So That's incredible. I can just imagine like in my head a visual of just like a, a machine as large as a garage for like a, like an RV, just like shooting out these, these freaking <laughs> houses. I, it's my visual in my head is pretty, pretty ridiculous. Well, cool. So you, you said when you, when we first started talking that you, you, when you moved out here, you saw a problem in that, you know, as you mentioned, more people were moving, less people were leaving. They weren't building, uh, they weren't building housing. So prices were going up, which means, I mean, you could have left if you wanted to, right? But you stayed, which means you actually have a, a tie to San Francisco, to the Bay Area. There's something that you like about it that, that makes you want to not just stay, but build it to help more people live sustainably there. I'd love to hear, like, what about San Francisco and more so the Bay Area do you, do you like so much? And um, what do you think it could be if, if uh, your company kind of works at scale? You know, what could San Francisco be, you know, in, in, in 10, 20 years? Yeah, I think that the Bay is a, a really special place uh, beyond just the, the beautiful weather all the time. I, I grew up in New Hampshire and then I went to college in Pittsburgh. So the, the weather here is a, a gift, truly. But um, beyond uh, things like the, the stunning, stunning weather and geography and everything like that, I, I think it really comes down to the people. So I, I've never been in a place where there's, there's so many different, really talented people working on so many different exciting problems all at once. And I think as, as a younger person who's interested in, in working in the technology space and, and having a big impact, I don't, I don't think there's any better place to be. Um, and I, I think when you look at... Um, the, the growth of the Bay and uh, who's able to, to live in the Bay, it, it starts to make me a little bit sad and I get a little bit worried if, if this is able to continue because um, housing is so expensive and uh, like young people are, are less and less able to, to come out here and sort of chase their dreams and things like that. So um, uh, our hope with this company uh, is to be a small part of the, the solution to uh, making the Bay a more equitable place to live and also um, one where, where people can come and continue to, to chase their dreams. Uh, that hits me. That hits me hard. Right, right. You know, right in my experience, because like, you're totally right in that. I'm a young person. I have ambition. I would move to the Bay, you know, if, if I, if I had the means, but it's just, it is pretty, it's pretty pricey. So you had a company like rent in the backyard that kind of changes the game and it changes people like me and our views our views on 
can we move? Oh, maybe we can with this option, which is pretty exciting. Something I want to move on to is um, a little bit away from rent the backyard and real estate and more just a peek into your brain and into your mind that, you know, you're, you're a founder of this, of this awesome company. You, 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 you're attracting talented investors, people. I know a lot of people are interested in what you're doing. I'm kind of curious, what are some of the things that you spend your time thinking about, whether it's problems in the world, whether it's technologies, different startups, um, but like, what do you think about when you're not working uh, on, on this company for like one hour out of the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like to, I, I'm a big reader. So I, I consume a, like a, a ton of just really rapid fire sort of like content, but not from as traditional sources. So I, I'm subscribed to something like 100 people's different like personal newsletters. Uh, and I'm sort of a sucker for longer form, like articles uh, that tell me about something like really distinct in the world. So um, I know uh, there's uh, one of my favorites is, is someone from Stripe, uh, Patio11, uh, who uh, writes really great articles on like building SaaS businesses, but also on like the economy of Japan. <laughs> so he, uh, he had an interesting piece that I read a little while ago about how um, the Japan has a has like a, a so like a, a different like an urban it is really urbanizing, or, or is very urban as a city, like all the young people leave their uh, uh, countryside prefectures and, and go into the city uh, and that's really hurt the prefectures budgets so there's been, been this whole economy that's risen up around um, like this this sort of tax incentive where people can go and basically like give money back to their hometown but then the hometowns can give them money back as a rebate so it's become this whole like uh, like tax like money washing system which is really interesting. Uh, I read Money Stuff, which is one of my favorites by, uh, by a writer at Bloomberg. And then um, a lot of just uh, different people's like personal blogs that I found through like Hacker News and other sources. So I spend a lot of the, the time that I don't think about, uh, that I'm not specifically focused on like front the backyard tasks, reading about like housing in the built environment, but then also on places like Hacker News and through people's personal, uh, personal blogs and things like that. Do you think that having a personal newsletter or having a almost your own personal publication with with these platforms like Review and Substack and Patreon um, is that going to grow into something bigger, or you or might will it stay niche ish within the tech community? It's hard to say. It's a lot of effort to go and uh, maintain a personal newsletter. So, like, I have a I have a blog that I'll, I'll work on occasionally. But um, like since starting, since starting my company, it's been a lot of, um, I, I've not been able to really maintain the personal newsletter and I'm blogging a lot less than I, than I can. So I think um, in tech, it might be somewhat unique because people have a little bit more leisure time on average, like the hours of their job aren't as, um, the hours of the work is not as sort of, uh, grueling per se as some other industries like if you're a, a, a truck driver or something like that uh, but I, I think that just as social media has gone and been able to give a lot of people voices uh, places like Substack and, and others will sort of continue to do that it's just a question of on what scale and and how many people will actually get into to writing like thousand word personal essays yeah, it's interesting. It's actually a realm that I spend a lot of time thinking about. It's kind of um, in the same realm of the what A Six and Z published. Uh, they published an article a couple of weeks ago called like, "The Passion Economy," and it's just about how in the future the economies are going to be like ran by these individuals having their own like like you Inc. Like you have a newsletter, you have a couple businesses, you this, you that. I just think it's going to be interesting to see the OS that powers that if that actually happens, like it's just a prediction. But I, I know that I, I host this podcast on Substack. So I'm hoping Substack does well because <laughs> er, early adopter, you know, you get, you get those benefits if, if, the, if the company works out. <laughs> yeah. I think personal brands, especially in like uh, the really competitive job market have become increasingly important. I think it's probably starting in technology and play with, because like places like GitHub made it so easy. It's just, Oh, I, I push my code to GitHub instead of to uh, um, like a private private repo or something like that. So being able to sort of start with that progress and then 
distinguish yourself uh, through like LinkedIn and a, a personal blog has become really important. But um, it definitely has not, it's not in all fields at this point. No, uh, it's not. I kind of want to dive into that, that point a little deeper. If, you know, you just mentioned that it's more important that people have personal brands out in the job market, um, which, which makes sense. Um, but if more people catch on and, uh, and people are building personal brands, and let's say 80% of people out there have personal brands, um, do you think the job market will care more about the brand than the actual like, degree or how you got the brand? Uh, like, how do you think about how work is changing and how the job market matches up with, uh, with education and with the system that we have right now? Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think recruiters will be pretty exhausted if every single candidate they, they get an application from has a really strong personal brand. So I think there's definitely um, a, a dilutive effect there, wherein like right now, like if you're, if you apply for a job and you're the only person that's written a blog or has like a really strong portfolio of work, like a recruiter can spend more time looking at it. But at the point where everyone's doing it, I worry that it's like, it hurts the, um, I, I worry that it might like hurt the equality of like, uh, or like the the access that people have to different jobs, because like if you're um, closer to the end of the spectrum where it's like harder to make ends meet, being able to take the time to actually put together a portfolio and um, like write long form blog posts and things like that isn't necessarily a luxury you can like afford to do. So I, I think that's like a an effect I'd worry about. I know in computer science that's already kind of a a thing, especially on the the portfolio side, like a lot of uh, a lot of people want to take a look at your GitHub. But if you're just sort of uh, if you're working your nine to five and you have a family, being able to take the time to actually produce like a a portfolio of uh, things I coded, just not not for work, uh, is a lot. So I think like employers need to be realistic about like their expectations, but at the same time, like as a candidate, it, it's a nice little hack if you can find a way to, to make a recruiter care about you more than, more than other candidates. Yeah, that, that's, that's really insightful. I haven't thought about that, that element, but it's 100% uh, real and, and, and relevant. I feel like once everyone has a brand, it's just what's the next thing? Like what's the thing after having a brand? Because the, 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 smartest, uh, the smartest people will always like uh, think of how to get ahead in a market. Um, but of course, there will always be people that can't get ahead because, you know, because you just said, because they're like, just trying to make ends meet. It's an interesting perspective. So, so shifting the conversation a little bit. Uh, so you, you do, uh, I should have asked this already. Uh, do you mind sharing when you started Rent the Backyard? And, and what have you learned so far since you've started it, whether it's a short term or long time? Um, like, what have you learned so far on your journey? Yeah, so we started the company a little bit over a year now, and it's been a really fantastic learning experience. So being able to like um, interact with a, a really wide variety of folks across like the construction space, which we weren't as familiar with. Like we've we've had a learning curve that's just been uh, like we've had hockey stick growth in that respect, and then also being able to figure out um, how to work with cities has been a um, a really remarkable experience. Uh, there are some things like. In some ways, it's like learning a new language because um, when when you go to a city, like there's there's the codes, and then there's talking to the um, the different planners who usually are, are extremely kind people and will give you a a great deal of their time to really really help you understand what's going on, and um, to just get really deep into that built world has been incredibly exciting. Uh, of course, we just uh, went through Y Combinator as well, the the startup accelerator. And we've been um, we've been really excited by uh, just the the fantastic variety of people that we met there as well. So uh, all sorts of people building really incredible companies, and um, it, it makes me really really optimistic about the world. So I think um, there's been a lot of really hard skills that I've learned since starting a company, but um, the the part that I've I've definitely cherished the most has been the, the people I've I've been so fortunate to interact with and and meet and learn about what they're working on as well. Do you mind sharing uh, some examples of, uh, of companies or people that you met that really are exciting and interesting and you think are going to do good things for the world? Yeah. So there's um, one of my favorite companies from the last Y Combinator batch was um, 
I, I forget their name, but it, it started with a Z and, and it's definitely on the, like the tech crunch overview, but they're building like a, like an Uber Eats style delivery service for um, Iraq. So like Iraq doesn't actually have like an, it, to my, to my understanding from talking to the founders for a, a little bit, like Iraq doesn't really have a system of addresses. So they have to go and they're building this company that, that is delivering food, but at the same time, they're kind of nation building by, um, by coming up with like all these like very, very basic building blocks. And I think that's going to put them in a really incredible position to, to really sort of shape that nation and, and make it into something uh, like sort of more stable and, and, and better uh, because it's really change coming up from the, uh, from building up from the ground and they're sort of uniting all these different like political factions or um, religious factions. So Sunnis and Shias and Kurds all, all working together to, to make the country a greater place. Um, one of the, the companies that we, uh, we like a lot as well is, um, is Project Ren. So they're basically like a Netflix uh, uh, style like offset subscription. So basically you can offset your, um, your carbon uh, emissions by going and, and signing up for their service each month and taking like a, sh a short little quiz and they're working with like a lot of great projects to do things like reforestation and then also like carbon sequestration uh another one of our, our favorite companies is building a, a robin hood app for uh for the country of india to try to go and uh make it much much easier for them to go or uh, for for like people in india to access like uh u.s stocks and being able to like sort of share in that economic growth so a lot of really um really empowering companies that are are going and, and building a whole a whole suite of um great things for the world. But um yeah, there's there's too many to name. So that's just the, the ones on the top of my head right now. Of course, of course. Well, I love when when YC has their uh, demo day and then they they announce all of their companies just on their website and I just spend a day, I click through every one. And they're all just so cool. And then I found yours. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, this is cool too. I want to talk to him <laughs> or talk to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that, I, I, I think it's twice a year. I, I love just the ability to, to figure out who's gone through YC and, and, and what are they building for the world? Because usually a lot of those companies do very well, you know, which is, uh, which is a testament to their power. Uh, well, cool. So, so that's awesome. I, I have uh, one more question for you. Uh, before we before we wrap it up uh, so my last question is if you were talking to someone who you know wanted to start a company they didn't know the they didn't know really the, the best way to do it but they had an idea they had a problem they wanted to solve uh, but they didn't know the first step what advice would you give them to get started uh, talk with your friends, I guess would be my, my advice. So being able to, to have someone who's a really good sounding board is incredibly valuable. Um, and I, I think trying to find a, a co-founder as well is really important because one, it means that you can kind of convince someone, like if, if you can get another person like to, to believe in your idea too, it's probably a little less crazy than you think it is. And then also just being able to have like a sounding board and sort of a person who can be there uh, with you through like the sort of long grind of, of, of starting a company is incredibly important. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for my co-founder, Brian. I, I would really, um, I, I know there are some, some solo founders out there, uh, including my, my dad actually. Uh, but I, I don't, I don't think I could ever be a solo founder. So I have a lot of respect for, for solo founders. And I, I think that, uh, if possible, being able to find a co-founder and just having a, or at least having a person who's a, a really good sounding board to talk to is really important. All right. Well, you all heard it here first. If people wanted to learn more about you or learn more, learn more about Rent the Backyard, where can they find you on the internet? Sure. So um, our website is just rentthebackyard.com. Uh, I'm on, tw uh, we're on Twitter with just at Rent the Backyard. And then my personal Twitter is at S-Q-B-U-R-L. So. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I think this company could be really big and you're playing with some really interesting forces and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it progresses. And maybe one day I'll move into one of your houses. Who knows? <laughs> but thank you, thank you for coming on. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Matt.